All right, good morning, good morning. I'm definitely excited to be here. I'd like to start off with 1993. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm sitting in my office on my cube, and my vice president comes to me. Now, I understand at IBM, at vice president is manager, second line manager, third line manager, director, senior director and vice president. So a vice president at IBM has usually around 10 to 20,000 people working for him. IBM had 220,000 people at that time. Uh, he sits in an office about the size of this room, you know, and he comes to my cube. And I've never really been nervous. Uh, and he said, Klein, can we talk? Like, no, we can't talk, I'm working. Yeah, yeah, we can talk. So we, we, we he says, um, I, I'm looking over and your skill set, and you're one of the few people who know how to deploy and, and set up OS2, which is a Windows-based operating system. He said, I, I need some help, and I have a proposal for you. He said, how would you like to go to Barcelona for a couple of months, and then come and go to Norway for a year, come back to Atlanta for two years, and go over to Japan for a year, and then go to Australia for a couple of months? I go, that works for me. Uh, he said, um, can you leave in two weeks? I go, yeah, I can leave in two weeks. I said, well, what am I going to be doing? And he said, oh, we're, we're going to we take over the Olympic Games, and I need somebody who understands the technology and understands how to put it all together. And I go, yeah, sure, no problem. So two weeks later, I get on a plane, I go to Barcelona. Um, never been out of the country, I get a passport. Didn't realize you can get a passport in 48 hours if the company has enough money and does all this stuff for you and takes you where you need to be, and it just happens. Because when I went to get my passport on my own, it didn't take 48 hours, and it cost a lot of money. Anyway, I get to Barcelona, and they're telling me, here are all the systems, here are all the problems, here's the integration, we're using this new technology, we're going to integrate with this timing system, and next thing you know, I'm documenting, and I'm integrating with 42 systems, and 17 of the applications are brand new and haven't been completed yet. And they say, how do you make this work? And I go, oh, that's going to be interesting. Um, so, long story short, I consulted, I got all the information, I left Barcelona, go, started going to Norway, because we're going to build this same system in Norway. We didn't own it in Barcelona, we owned it in Norway. And at that time, is when I realized the concept of risk management and project management. Because somewhere along the line, I had to lay out a plan, a pattern, a structure, in order to put this solution together for billions of people to watch, and also understanding that the Olympics starts without technology. Uh, long story short, we had a successful Olympics in Norway, I did a successful in Atlanta, went on to Japan, went on to Australia, and after that I was done. I, I said, I, I got to get out of here. That's six years of 64 hours a week. I uh, worked 88 out of 92 days one time and, and realized that I was getting compensated, but not compensated like some of the other people who didn't have to work that much. And, and I say that because that was my introduction to what is project management. And so throughout my career, I moved on and I, I stayed with IBM for 10 years. I started doing e-commerce. I kicked off the global services practices, the consulting practices, where I'm actually d delivered, you know, Walmart, Macy's, Victoria's Secret, Amtrak, um, and, and it's on a slide, and I'll go through a lot of those. Um, but what I really learned was the principles of project management can, management can be applied everywhere. I've delivered projects through corporate America for $20,000 all the way to $300 million. And the philosophy and the mindset is exactly the same. It's the amount of detail you put in each step that changes. But I've learned one thing. If you bypass it, if you miss it, if you skip it, you have a problem. Um, I teach, um, she calls me doctor because I teach at SMU. I teach in the grad program. I teach project planning, project management. I take network architectural design, and I teach computer science. And the whole mindset, I teach in the grad level only, uh, and the seniors, but I teach the concept of how do you deliver and execute and implement a solution. All right, go to the next slide. So that's kind of a little bit about my background. Um, who I am and what we do, we basically are credentialed experts in project management. Now that's very important. Not only are we credentials, but experts, but it's the services. It's de-risking project execution, project and IT health assessment. I'll come into your organization if you're a large organization or medium, or even if you're two people. Let me look at and let me look at your project um, IT structure. How are, you, how are you delivering this project? We take it for granted that we have two technical people and we're real smart and we can deliver it. But when you start getting into the integration and you start getting into the requirements, if you don't set that up and lock it down, we were just talking about this, somebody's going to give, hey, what about this? What about that? What about this? Well, next thing you know, you're just working and you're not getting paid. That's not good. 
So if you set 10 requirements and you lock them in and they sign them, and I'll show you how to do that, and here's your delivery model, well, they come back and they want to add another piece, they want to add another function. I love that. Go ahead, add it in. Here's the extra cost. Add it in. Here's the cost. But if I don't have that baseline and I don't have that governance, if I don't have them tell them how I'm going to work it, then they can utilize me over, they can use me over and over again by changing the target without getting paid. I don't mind you changing the target, but I need to get paid. Um, the other thing is coaching and training for project managers. So I go into organizations. If you have 10 project managers, one project manager, I will sit with them. I will talk to them, and I will help them understand what they need to do in order to be better. But I do this part-time. So no longer do I come into your place for 40 hours. I, I don't need 40 hours. I need two hours, four hours, eight hours. If you're a smaller company, buy me lunch, and I'll tell you how to set it up. After you get to the first deal, buy me dinner. After you get to the second deal, now we can talk about a contract. Because, we, you know, we're here to help everyone else get better. And I can do this by using my expertise. Um, contract deployment and execution, one of the biggest challenges is you don't build your contract right. The contract has to be tight. If it's not tight, once again, you leave yourself open. Next slide. Um, problems we solve. 54% of IT projects failures are, are attributed to project management, where it's 3% are technical challenges. Think about that. 54 are IT problems, are project management problems. Only three are technical. My job is to get rid of that 54 so we can focus on the technology. The technology we can make work. But if you mess up project management, we don't know what we're designing, what we're delivering, how it's actually working. Um, we do scope creep, over allocated resources, poor communication, monitoring controllable, affordable ex executive level project management that improves success rates. Over allocated resources. You really need to know when you need resources, how you need resources, what are they going to do, what are they going to accomplish, and how do you get them out? All right, next slide. Um, client experience, we talked about it. Fortune 500 companies, startup companies, these are some of the customers. Those are Olympics, AT&T, IBM, Macy's. This is a small set of about 50 companies that I've worked with all over the world. I've delivered projects in 20 countries and five continents. Next slide. And then finally, Here's what I propose, and here's how my contract works. I come in $21,000, 13 weeks, 12 hours a week, normally $225. I discount it to $135. Uh, evaluation period is 90 days. Now, for startup companies, small companies here, once again, buy me lunch. Let's talk about what you need to do. As you get to the bigger contracts, we can talk about this. And then what I do after 90 days, I go on an ROI model. If I don't save you money, if I don't improve what you're doing, don't pay me. So if you have a $100,000 contract and I can come in and save you and you, you expect your cost to be 50000 and I can come in and save you 10000 then pay me five. So that's how I, I'm, I'm working. And, and, and I'll look at it. And if I can't save it because you're already efficient, then you don't need me. I'll just guide you. But I work on ROI deals. I basically save you money. I improve your delivery. I lower your cost. And I get a percentage of that. So that's how I work. That's my background. I've been doing this for almost 30 years now. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you for um, paying attention. Any questions? Dr. Smith, thank you very much. Um, great information. You know, we'll talk afterwards because you probably know my uncle and some other people I know from Atlanta. Oh, cool. Um, um, go back two slides. One more. Okay, good. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so how did you move yourself down to Dallas is the first question I have. And uh, how did you re relocate down here? Well, long story short, I started in Charlotte. I went to Atlanta. I went to Norway. I went to New York. I went to Japan. I went to D.C. I went to Char Memphis. I went to Dallas. I went to Singapore. I went back to Dallas. I went to Colombia and Brazil. I came back to Dallas. So there you go. Centrally located? Well, I, I started working with Alcatel Lucent when I left DC. Okay. And then from there, I went overseas and then I went with Ericsson, I went with Amdoc. So, so basically, I came to Dallas because I needed to get out of the Northeast. Uh, DC was when 9 11 and a sniper happened. I went to Memphis, time stood still, so I had to leave Memphis. And I came to Dallas and I've been here since 2010, off and on. Okay. Perfect. And I'll be here for another year and a half. My son's graduated in 2020, and I'm going somewhere else. Okay. 
Thank you for your presentation. I'm interested to know about uh, client acquisition and you know, given how many different companies you've worked with and just your expansive network, are you striking contracts, new deals with some of your previous clients or if not, like what steps are you taking to acquire new clients? Okay, so, so I have two primary approaches right now. Uh, the first one is I am reaching out to my former clients. So I have a proposal in to Toyota, to Nissan, to AT&T, to IBM, to Boeing, uh, to Amtrak, uh, Bombardier, about 10 contracts into companies where I've done work before and they know me. I've only gotten one signed, so, but that's one, and I'm still working that angle. I was telling um, gentlemen back, I, I have done 25% of my contacts that I'm working with. I am also on uh, several nonprofit boards so I'm meeting with a lot of venture capitalists and I meet with a lot of um, VC, VCs and equity firms to do mergers and acquisition type work. So I had a couple of proposals there. So that's the first one on my list. And then I have all my certifications from minority perspective. So I'm going after a lot of RFPs, I'm going after a lot of government contracts, and I'm trying to work with primes to be their minority vendor. My third path, which I haven't started, is I need to hire and bring in, and I can't say hire, I need to partner with a sales firm. I, I'm not a salesperson. I've sold many things, but I'm not a legitimate salesperson, and I know that. So I want to try to find someone who um, is looking to s do sales and work off how much we make. So I can't pay you right now, but if you know if it's a hundred thousand dollar deal, instead of you getting a regular you know two thousand dollar commission, you know I'll give you thirty thousand dollars, and then I get seventy or however it takes to do the work. Um, and then we, we kind of move from there. We get the next deal, the next deal. So I'm looking for a salesperson who helps me grow the business, but they're part of that business that we're growing. So it's not a, you come in and get $500 for your introduction, you actually get paid. That's great. I do have one more question though, just about scaling in general, because obviously you have deep functional expertise in right. all of these areas, and that's difficult to match, especially with your years of experience. So when you take on so many contracts, like how, how are you kind of spreading yourself across those or looking to scale your business, understanding that that expertise and quality level needs to be maintained? Ah, great question. Where I, my end goal at the end of this year is I have three customers and I have three teams at the customer sites. So I have three full-time teams, but two project managers, one architect or one designer or one business analyst, they're working full-time at a, a very reasonable rate, and I'm working part-time at each of these locations coming in eight hours, 12 hours, and making sure that that delivery cycle stays true. So at, when I left Ericsson, I was running 42 projects at a time, and I had 30 people um, extended to 400. So I'm trying to take the same model and come in and do the expertise, do the leadership, make sure that that's delivered appropriately, bringing people in. Uh, I do have a fantastic network because I teach at SMU, I teach to grad students, I teach in computer science, and I can bring in the master's and PhD programs just like that, pay them money, they'll do the work. Uh, even the undergrads, a little bit less on the undergrads, but I have a, a full set of students who I can utilize for particular activities and work, and I can use the professors when we really want to get into some real um, research and scientific knowledge. I also have employees that have worked for me throughout my career that are full-time at different places. Um, I, did a I did a workshop recently and brought in, a comp brought in somebody from two of my companies that spent one day with me and helped go through the details of that analysis and they went back to work. So that's how I'm working now until I start getting more and more contracts. But my goal is to go part-time at each of the locations while I have a staff there. No, this is a really interesting. Um, uh, my boss is a PhD in risk management, and she did this for Target. So I've getting this oh, up you to know. my getting made this up to my ears. Um, but we're in a, sort of an adjacent space, so I sort of want to take her question a little bit further. And one of the challenges I've had with our business is, you know, we're actually helping to build the teams like uh, an employee-centric team. So we're sort of adjacent to what you're doing or, or attached to what you're doing. And one of the challenges I run into is <clears throat> when I do what you're doing right now, having this sort of three-dimensional discussion on what we're talking about. This is perfect. Where I struggle with is, here's what we do, and then two dimensions, explain it and have them get, get that. Have you been able to you know, cross over that threshold where you can you know, hand somebody something and say, here's what Client Smith does, and they go, okay, great, I want to talk to you. Uh, yes, I have a 
eight-page proposal that is signature ready on what I provide. It kind of matches the last slide on my cost, but I tell you exactly what I deliver. And I also have a one-pager that is my capabilities and kind of the background. And then I have a presentation pretty much just like this that I use to help them understand where I come in. Um, but the, the, the proposal is what I actually provide. It's project initiation, uh, it's project planning, it's project execution, project controlling. So that, and let's let, to, you know, forgive me, let me zero in No, on no, that, take your time. I'm, I'm sort of literally on the cusp of actually just sending an email about that. <laughs> um, so when you're doing that, are you essentially in part of the initial engagement saying, hey, here's a sample proposal, or here's an example of what we, I do that is, is either signature ready and or tailorable to what you really need, or are you doing that a little further into the discussion? So I have it's actually both approaches. So for my VCs, I send them ready to sign proposals because it's a, here are the services and skills that I offer. Which do you need? Here, tell me what 12 hours you want me to work and here's how you pay me. So when you need me, this is how you call me. I can come on site for one day and I do the other four hours remote. Um, so that's all in that proposal I send to the VCs primarily. For Toyota, they wanted a benchmarking. So I have a benchmarking proposal where I come in and compare your organization to other organizations. For Boeing, they needed a, um, a resource. How do, you, how do you deploy a resource management tool? You know, the, um, the HRIS systems. So I have a proposal that deploys a complex integrated system. Uh, and that proposal, I have to tweak the terminology because if I'm doing an SAP system, an HRIS system, a cloud system, if I'm doing a transportation system, I change it, but the flow and the concept stays the same. Gotcha. Yes. So, and, and then you're correct. When I send the proposal out for signature, it doesn't get signed. <laughs> it's a blueprint for them to come in and say, okay, well, we don't need this. We do need this. We don't need... That's fine. And now they've given me their requirements, so it makes it a lot easier. Right. Okay. Perfect. So is there an area, is there a, a, a type of business that is more in, in line with a particular industry, I should say, that is best suited for you, or is it open? You, you know, the, the industry that's best suited, I will go to a mid-tier company that is looking to deploy, I'm sorry, industry. Industry would be an IT, mid-tier company looking to integrate a new technology. Uh, app application-wise. So you're a company and you're transitioning and now you're ready to deploy Salesforce or you're ready to plug in a, a data analytics tool or you're ready, you're ready to put something else into your solution and that requires us to shift your organization. So there's organizational change behavior, there's requirements management in there and then there's the actual integration of how do you take your existing system and this system and make it actually work together. So I would say an IT mid-level mid company. The other one is a large IT or large company that's not IT. So a finance company, a transportation company, and a retail company, uh, a government industry that doesn't have the strong project management IT expertise because that's not what they do. See, I always think that and my background is manufacturing. I think that there's a big opportunity in small, mid-sized manufacturing companies who don't have that expertise in IT who are implementing a sales force or something that don't even know where to begin, and their project managers are more geared toward the manufacturing side, not toward making this uh, implementation work smoothly. That's so there's that's, another that's opportunity, a great there opportunity there that yes. I've seen because over 35 years, it's a big piece that's missing. I was in D.C. last week, and I was talking to the city of, of um, is the, can't call it the city, the D.C. I was talking to District of Columbia, um, the leadership there, and, and they have a sales force tool She's like, oh yeah, we have Salesforce, but we, we don't really know how to use it. Nobody has ever been trained on it, and we don't know what it really does and how it's integrated. And I said, how long have you been paying for this? She said, oh, at least nine months. And I said, how much can you spend without an RFP? And she came back and said, 18,500. I said, oh, give me 17,000, let me help you out. And so we're working through paperwork now because this is something straightforward. It's halfway deployed, but no one in the organization understands how to do it. So this is not really an IT problem. It's more of I need to help the organization lay out all their processes so that they can actually plug it in. Yeah, sorry I have to dominate this, but he triggered another thought because I did a Microsoft Dynamics implementation my last company that exactly had that problem where we didn't have the internal knowledge to project management. We were at the mercy of the SI, oh. essentially. 
So, which sort of leads me back to another comment that you made, that when you're talking about an IT mid-level company versus a large company, I, again, this feels like sort of the sweet spot I'm trying to figure out. Are you working with, are you working with SIs and sort of help, are, are you working with SIs to help them work with the a customer or are you working with the customer to help them work with an SI? Is that something? I'm working with the, I'm actually, it's, it's interesting you said that because I know all the SIs, right? A lot of, I don't know all of them. I'm working with the company that has just put out an RFP and an SI just won. And I wait about two weeks and I call them and say, so you're overwhelmed, you have no idea what they're asking you to do, you have none of the documents that they're asking you for and, and you're behind already. She say yes, and I say, and you're paying them and they're driving you crazy. And they go yes, I say, well you need to bring me in. Because what happens in SI bullies you. But they don't bully you because they're mean, they bully you because this is their structure. But what I do is I come in and I put in the structure for the company paying them, and this becomes the way we're going to work. And once again, I only need to come in for a day or two days. Maybe I come in for the first week, set up the flow, set up the process, tell the SA how we're working, take the two or three project managers who are struggling because they got full-time jobs, tell them when the SI can talk to them, when they can't talk to them, what they need, how that works, and then I come back every week for eight hours just to ensure the SI is doing what they're supposed to. So I put that filter between the SI and tell the SI how to work with us. But so when you, to answer your question, I go work with the company that the SI is driving crazy. SI doesn't want to hire me. If they hire me, they want to hire me full time so they can get the money over and over again. So I ran lots of different project executions at Microsoft for a very long time out of corporate. And work with loads of consultants. Accenture was usually our kind of our go-to for a lot of different things. And when you mentioned your ROI model, um, it kind of struck a chord with me because that's just something that Microsoft, believe it or not, and probably a lot of big companies, just terrible at measuring. It's like we would hire these companies, we come in, it's like, oh, $200,000, we'll put together this you know, business plan for you, we'll go out and we'll do some you know, uh, usability studies, blah, 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 blah. But in terms of reporting and tracking and being able to go back and report to management how much we really save, don't know. Um, what the customer experience, how did it improve, et cetera, don't know. So I just think that's a really fuzzy kind of way to compensate yourself. I'm wondering, like, how are you tightening up those specifics so that you have truly measurable success criteria? So, so the first thing is, is contract development and, execu and evaluation. So I actually have a contract into Microsoft right now. It's funny, I got a contract into Microsoft to help them with their community industry and community and university engagements. But, but I also am leaning into helping them with how they deploy Azure. Oh, okay. So it's, <clears throat> I'm getting in the other way, but once I get in, then I can go everywhere. But to answer your question, when I build a contract and when I put your, your, your risk resource plan together, let me back up, when you bring me in, you've already bid on a contract. And so you put a price on a contract for, let's say $200,000, and you estimated your cost when you did this contract at 100, let's make it easy. I now take your contract of 100,000 and say, okay, if I can do this for less than 100,000, then I'm looking for the difference of how much I save you and how much I make. I so. But what I'm going to do first is look at that 100000 and go, you know what? You're not going to deliver this 100000 The way you, you're going to deliver this at 175 mm -hmm. the way it's going now. Let me help you bring this down, and I'll prove to you why it's going to be 175 Now, if I can bring this to 150 and show you how to actually do it, then we split the, the, the um, 25K or however we want to do that. So I have to come in and, and re-baseline and show you what it's really going to cost and let's say you do it as 100, and I come in and realize you're overbooked and overstaffed, you're not connecting. I may say, you know what? I can deliver this, deliver this in $60,000. Give me a percentage of the, 60, of the 40 I save. If I only save 20, um, I, just, I did this four years ago with Amdocs. They brought me in. They were $8 million behind and nine months behind. I said, give me $100 an hour, and then give me a 10% of wherever I save you. And after four months, I came in, and I had already started saving them $3 million. And they renegotiated the contract and said, okay, we, we, we can't afford to pay you $300,000 every three, four months. I said, okay, well, give me $200 an hour and give me a minimum of 50 hours a week. And they started, I said, here's a calculation. <laughs> and they started, because they needed to see the difference, right? And so instead of paying me $900,000, they ended up paying me $280,000, which I'm okay. 
be okay with that. But that's but I had to do the ROI. So when you have a project already running, it's the easiest. Because you're already in trouble. So let me show you how to stop the bleeding and then whatever I save you, you pay me. Okay. And what happens when, you know, you just have these, you know, hard headed devs, hard headed Microsoft and we're still bleeding and it's not because of anything you're doing. It's just we're not actually executing in the way that you're telling us to do. And then we go over the hundred thousand. So contract development. Happens? So contract development is it's about locking in the scope and the deliverables. So I'll have in there, let's say I know your contract and you don't give me the time you need to. So you have to pay me for the additional hours that I'm here and you're not helping me. So I get paid more hourly than I do because you're not helping me deliver the solution. So, so I, put, I tighten my contract to where you're, if you don't want to pay attention and work with me, and I tell you up front how many hours I'm going to need, who I'm going to need, and how it all works. I give you a very detailed plan. If you don't meet that, then there's a cost for you not meeting that because it's a cost for my time. And it's tough because they don't want to sign that contract. But they're bleeding, so it's a lot easier. Um, so my background is organizational development and change management, and I heard you mention that earlier. And one of the things I've identified is I have quite a few more IT companies approaching me where it used to not be, be the yes. situation. Um, so what do you think is really driving um, more of the um, OD realm in IT and, you know, what's the value? So, so that's a great question. The companies are now... So let me go back in, in, in 89 when I went to IBM. We used to just build software applications and give them to customers. This is what you get. You know, for those who are over 50 and you worked with IBM and Microsoft, they just gave you application and that was just what you had to do. And you had to change to work them. It's starting to come back. So what's happening is IT is getting a software. And this application, you need it, but in order for you to use it, you gotta change the way your organization works. It's, it, we went through a phase where we customized everything. But now that's too complicated sometimes. So you customize a little, you, you, have, you customize components, but your organization has to now, if you're doing accounts payable and you were used to doing steps one through nine, well the tool you have now, you only do steps one through four. Which means you gotta change your internal processes in your organization and how they function, and you gotta restructure people, retrain people, and that's what's happening. They're getting more tools, especially when they go to the cloud, and I say go to the cloud, it means you get rid of all the software, the hardware, and then a subscription service. Well, your subscription service means your account payables have to be involved, your accounts receivable, you have to have your customers, you have to have a different log on. It's a different management structure to do the same activities. And, and you all have 360. You, you don't do Office 360 like you did Office. You got to do a little couple, something extra. You got to log on, you got to find the app, instead of just clicking on Word and going. So. It's IT is changing, the, the applications are changing the way companies have to work now. Okay, I've got the last question of the day. So, great presentation, great information. What can we do for you today to help you out? So, so the, the best thing for me is, first piece is if you have a, a project that's an IT related or even organization that, that you are trying to figure out how to set up and how to start, uh, like I said, call me, let's do lunch, let's do coffee, and, and let me help you get there because that, to me, is going to be the gateway of our relationship. And as your companies, as your deals get bigger and bigger, you're going to need more project management and I can start making money there. Uh, the other thing is, is if you know someone who has a, a project that's, you know, um, 100000 to $20 million already that you know that they're in trouble, that's red, that's struggling, uh, introduce me and bring me in as your partner. And, and let me see how to help them fix that. Uh, so those are the two ways. If you know somebody who's struggling right now or companies that are struggling or companies you're working with that are struggling, uh, or you know they need a project manager, they don't have them, bring me in to help that person because helping that person or helping that group allows you to get more business. Um, Alcatel Luce and, I'm sorry, Erickson, the guy brought me into CenturyLink, me to CenturyLink that said, hey, bring Klein on to help you all organize your organization so that I can sell you more business. Because they were so disjointed, they couldn't get through stuff to get him and sign his proposals. And, and that actually worked out well. I think I went for $15,000 for three weeks, and help, I didn't go all the full time, but now they're actually able to get proposals out, and they called me at random. So that's how you can help me. And, and I really, once again, I appreciate your time. Thanks for listening. Uh, and I'll hang around if you want to have additional conversations and I have some cards and definitely uh, would like to stay in touch. Thank you so much. <laughs>